Hello, everybody. This is Mark Mayette with Entrepreneur Radio on the Pro Business Channel. And Rich, how are we today? We're unbelievable. How are you? <laughs> Living the dream. <laughs> right? Living, we got a great show today. But, oh, it, but before we introduce our guest, yeah. you know, so things okay for you? Absolutely, yeah. And it is, it's kind of, we were talking about beforehand, it's kind of Entrepreneur University Radio. <laughs> right? <laughs> entrepreneur you. <laughs> <laughs> well, from the standpoint of, of uh, the topic yeah. today and talking about entrepreneurs, and I read something a couple of weeks ago from the London Times. They, they released an article a couple of weeks ago that was talking about an epidemic that's happening in the United States. And it's a professional epidemic that's isolated to the United States. And it's men in their fifties that are facing three critical uh, challenges today, depression, addiction, suicide. And it's all pointing. The root cause is careers and the downturn in the economy. A number of years ago, sucked that demographic under and to the point where there's this there's this epidemic happening in the United States that that is isolated only to the United States Um, and it's one of those issues that I think we're still trying to get our arms around and we have three guests today that will have a definite impact on that rich and so so um, I, I look forward to having a great show today. Yeah, absolutely. And before we jump into the guest, um, just for our listeners listening to Entrepreneur Radio, so um, uh, that's a phenomenal or a very compelling statistics, but talk to us a little bit about the mission. Give your 30-second uh, kind of highlight on the uh, the concept behind Entrepreneur Radio for maybe folks turning in, tuning in for the first time. Well, I, I four years ago, I left corporate America after 24-plus years, and I was kind of in that in that demographic and still am I'm 54. (laughs) Um, but I, I was at a point where I was not motivated, nor was I finding, you know, what I felt I was really able to give in a corporate role. But in behind me though, I was not driven by getting another job. So I literally went through into the desert and, and, and through the desert came out and realized, you know, what I'm very passionate about is helping people and get clarity around whether or not your next chapter in your professional careers could be something that might be entrepreneurial. And entrepreneurship overall, you know, entrepreneurship is, if we are really analyze it, if I ask people for a definition of entrepreneurship, you'll probably get, you ask four people, you get four definitions. At the core, it's all about taking an enterprise and it's yours. Now, that could be any number of shapes. It, and so what I do with my, my clients is help them figure out, do you have the professional capital, the background, the skill set, the drive to, to either fit on that entrepreneurial band? And, and you have a startup. You can buy a standalone family business. You can buy a business in a box. And what we're finding, that uh, ARP released a study that 40% of all employees will be 1099 contract employees by 2020. That's 60 million people. So that, in some ways, is going to be a form of entrepreneurship also. So my real opportunity when I work with my clients is to give them clarity as to whether or not they fit on that band. And then, depending on where they fit on the band, what that could look like. So my mission is to get people clarity around what I call their U2.0. Right. Right. And, and <clears throat> not the band, you two, but yeah. Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, well said. And uh, with that, let's go ahead and jump into our uh, our guest lineup here in the studio this morning. And what we'd like to do is maybe just um, welcome each guest uh, just briefly and uh, introduce yourself. Let us let us know what you might be uh, chatting about, who you're with, and then we'll start off with our first uh, interview. So um, if you want to just start us off, introduce sure. yourself. Good morning, everyone. I'm Danielle Rubenstein. I oversee alumni career services at Goizueta Business School, part of Emory University here in Atlanta, Georgia, and help alumni with um, really any aspect of their career, whether they're not sure what they want to do or they do know what they want to do. They need help with marketing, um, putting together a resume, getting their LinkedIn profile together, and then job search strategy all the way through prepping for interviews and negotiation. Perfect. All right, and uh, uh, our next guest uh, joining us in the studio, if you want to introduce yourself, let us know what you might be chatting about. Good morning. I'm Susan Gilbert, Dean of the Stetson School of Business and Economics at Mercer University, and we have a mission of developing entrepreneurial leaders and responsible global citizens, 
And to that end, we've done a lot in the area of entrepreneurship, including partnering with an incubator down the street, Atlanta okay. Tech Village. Oh, wow. And two days ago, um, announced the launch of Mercer Innovation Center, the first of its kind, in Middle Georgia, uh, which is open both to students and the community. Um, and we had Lieutenant Governor Casey Cagle down there as well for our launch. So very exciting time for me to be talking about entrepreneurship, but um, to respond a little bit to, to Mark's opening comments about the London Times, that was a... Um, a very depressing statistic, and, and you know, um, to my colleagues here in career services, nobody tells you you're going to need career management when you're 50. Right. Yeah. You know, right. We, yeah. we pursue yeah. it as, uh, you know, when we're 20. Early on, yeah, <laughs> right. And, yeah. Uh, and we, we set up these great infrastructures, but um, I hear you. I've seen many of my friends receive their, their pink slips in their 50s, well, wow. um, well, and and hopefully during conversations we're having today, um, and what Mark's uh, brings to the table can help alleviate some of those uh, statistics or um, and uh, those anxiety issues for some of those folks. Uh, let's go and introduce our um, and welcome our third guest to the studio. So if you uh, let our listeners know a little bit about yourself and you'll be, uh, what you might be sharing with. Hello, I'm Marilyn Santiago. I'm the associate director at. Robinson College of Business at Georgia State University. I spend an awful lot of time working with graduate students who are consider themselves to be either under, underemployed, unemployed, or in career transition. We spend a lot of time getting them back into the workforce, understanding what the for workforce looks like because it's changed from year to year. And this is a different decade, different way to uh, express yourself and to brand yourself and how important that is. And so branding is, ex is especially important for those who are coming to college for the first time after being in, wor in the workforce and now out of the workforce. And so we spend a lot of time helping them understanding what that means, how to empower their families to get back into the workforce. All and, right. And we see a theme here for this particular podcast. We have um, uh, the educational stalwarts in, in, in Georgia with us today. So we have Emory Mercer in Georgia State. So right. um, and, and so from the standpoint of, of the format, ideally what will be great is we're going to now spend a few minutes with each of our guests. Um, and then from there, what we'll do is we will, after that, we'll just have some uh, group discussion around some of the things that come up in that discussion. So, so Rich, introduce our first uh, guest. Absolutely. Will there be a test after this show? Or whatever. I feel like I'm back in school all of a sudden, right? Um, all right. So uh, Dr. Uh, Susan P. Gilbert is uh, the dean of Eugene uh, W. Stetson University, our school in uh, business and economics. And uh, you earned your Ph.D. in economics from the University of Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. All right. And, um, and then also you were the dean of the School of Business and Technology at Thomas Edison State College. Mm -hmm. Is that in Florida? New Jersey. New Jersey, okay, because he has a home in, in uh, Florida, right, in Fort Myers. Yeah, but a museum in New Jersey. Oh, okay. Not a university. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and um, you, had over, uh, you had oversight of over 200 faculty and degree programs serving 10,000 students. Prior to that, you were the executive director of MBA programs and associate dean at Rutgers University. And um, you're cur is this currently now you're the associate dean, dean at the, um, and professor at Emory University? I, I, I actually started my career at Emory University 20 years oh, okay. um, as, an, as an associate professor and then later associate dean and then got ambitious. Right. And, and <laughs> did my own career exploration and decided that maybe it was time to be a dean. So All right. happily, I'm back in Georgia okay. as dean of the business school at Mercer University. Okay. And actually, when we were chatting before the show, um, uh, Susan or Danielle had to remind me that uh, she was one of my professors when I went to Emory Goyce What a Business School. Oh wow! In 1997, <laughs> it's so. been a nice reconnection this year. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's crazy. And you currently sit on several advisory boards and councils. Uh, yes, I do. The most important one at the moment is the advisory board for the Mercer Innovation Center, which oh, wow. is populated mostly by entrepreneurs uh, in Georgia. And you also sit in the editorial board of the International Leadership journal 
from Thomas Edison State College. Wow. Well, we need maybe have you on international business radio. <laughs> <laughs> but with that being said, uh, Mark, uh, let's yeah. go ahead and turn things over to you. So, uh, uh, Dr. Gilbert, thanks a lot for being here today. And, My and so, and speak a little bit more about the Innovation Center and the demographic that you're serving there currently at Mercer. What does that look like? So, um, we read a statistic in the National Business uh, Chamber Foundation that um, between half to two-thirds of millennials hope to one day own their own company. And it struck me that as a university and as a business school, we should certainly be trying to help those students achieve their dreams. And that led to a discussion about the broader impact of entrepreneurship on economic development and the need for such a facility in middle Georgia. And so two days ago, we announced this, this new center with incredible community support, so much so that we had to introduce um, community memberships on three different levels so that people in the, in the community with great ideas could learn, could be inspired, could be coached, um, and maybe find investors. Somebody asked me a question. I'm going to ask you the same question that they asked me. Are entrepreneurs born or are they made? There's certainly, you know, I'm not a psychologist. So, so uh, you know, economists have no business answering that question. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but I would say a combination. I would say there are certainly, you know, the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world. And recently, you know, we heard from David Cummings, founder of Atlanta Tech Village. We have an executive forum where he spoke about knowing that he was an entrepreneur, I think, by eighth grade, if I'm, mm. if I'm correct. Mm -hmm. But there are certainly many, many who find an opportunity and plug away at it and become successful. And I can remember a speaker at Gosweda, actually, um, who was a, a, a successful entrepreneur of a storage unit company. And, and the remark that, that struck me was, I didn't grow up wanting to own a storage unit company. Mm -hmm. You know, that's just something that, that came my way. Mm -hmm. So I think they can be made. I think they can be trained so that they have a higher percentage likelihood of success. Yes. And I think these days, as I'm sure you're hearing, it is a great time to be an entrepreneur. You know, the cost of capital has never been lower. The amount of venture capital has never been higher. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously other opportunities are drying up. Right. Or, now, now yeah. speaking to that demographic, do you also does that innovation center also serve the alums of Mercer? Um, Mercer has an open door policy with mm -hmm. alums. I mean, they can use uh, they have full access to career management services, yep. same as current students. And not only is it open to alums um, by joining the Mercer Innovation Center, uh, non alums. In fact, we're going to embark on a search uh, this year for five Mercer Innovation Fellows. So no connection to the school whatsoever is required. The only age limit is over 21. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, we're willing to uh, provide a year of housing, office space, access to interns, access to labs uh, for a full year plus $20,000 cash Nice. if they will relocate and start their business in Macon, Georgia, in middle Georgia. Good for you. And, and, and that's, that's uh, coming up. When it, uh, how's the selection process going to work for that? Well, right now we have a website, yep. mic.mercer.edu, and we're accepting applications between now and uh, February, I believe. Good for you. That's and good for Mercer. So, Thank you. so there is life after Goizueta Bitson <laughs> School. There is, but it was a great place to be trained and and to learn. Good for you. And and you know, uh, Rich, this is going to be great um, appetite for our uh, next guests as well. Because can you introduce Danielle? Because what I want to do is bring us in together as a group. 
and just hear from each speaker initially. Absolutely. And I was just listening to that thinking I've qualified out of two of those categories, right? <laughs> <laughs> but um, all right. So Danielle uh, Rubenstein? Rubenstein, yeah. Okay. Nationally certified counselor has been uh, providing coaching, support, and resources to young professionals and executives regarding career development and transitions for 15 years. Uh, you must have started at what, five or something? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh, thank uh, you for that. <laughs> Um, currently uh, manages the Alumni Center Services offices office at Emory University. Help me with the... Uh, Goizueta. Goizueta. That's mm-hmm. what I was going to say. Uh, business school. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's and, uh, and offers career counseling, resume reviews, networking assistance, job search, strategy advice, and interview preparation to all alumni. Also performs career counseling uh, consulting for private clients on an ad hoc basis. So yes. welcome again to uh, Entrepreneur Radio. Thank you so much. So, Danielle, how does it feel to be sitting next to uh, Susan Gilbert again? Oh, it's great <laughs> to see her. It has been too long. And so it's, it's nice to catch up and hear what's been happening and all the exciting things that are going on. And, and let's, bring, uh, let's bring Goizueta in the spotlight. So what's, what's uh, new and exciting at Goizueta as it relates to career management? Yeah, there's, um, there's lots of stuff going on. You know, Goizueta is always trying to come up with new programs, new centers, things like that. We have a fairly new dean, year and a half now, um, who's been wonderful, Erica James. And um, there's, yeah, there's, it, I'm trying to think of something specific, like this innovation center that Susan's talking about, but it's, it's a it's a great place to be. There's a lot of activity in the community in terms of both students and alumni, and um, very engaged. And so, for you in your role, and then the uh, career management uh, department's role, what are you seeing any trends with the folks that you're serving? It's a it's a, that's a really good question because I think the economy has gotten a lot better over the past couple of years, which has been nice. And for a lot of a long time, people who had jobs, even if they weren't very happy, were just keeping their heads down because they were just saying, "I'm thankful I have a job. I just want to stay where I am, even if it's not the best situation." So what I'm seeing now is is people are picking their heads up and saying, "Okay, where do I want to be? What do I want to be doing?" and really seizing that as an opportunity. So a lot of exploration is happening and a lot of change. Um, you know, people are, are making moves that haven't been making moves for five years, six years, yep. long time. Yep. Um, for you, with your resource, you know, being able to help connect people who are interested in entrepreneurship, that is something that I'm seeing as well, a, a drive towards that. Um, and that's an interesting statistic that you shared at the beginning. And I, I can't say that I've witnessed that over and over again. I'm not surprised by that statistic. Um, but I know there is struggle mm-hmm. with the middle-aged population, I think for men and for women, anybody who's trying to start over in a career if they've gotten that pink slip. So um, what I try to impart is that there's, there's always hope. There's always something that you can do and really trying to evaluate what is it that you want to do. This can be an opportunity that wasn't necessarily something you asked for, but something you can seize and really make a difference in your life and the trajectory for the rest of your career path. Now, sometimes people wake up and they don't know that they could be an entrepreneur because they've always worked for somebody. They've always had a J-O-B. Mm-hmm. So, and and it's not like they come to you and say, "I'm thinking of starting a business." Do you ever have someone that comes to you and say, "I'm just a, kind of in a quandary," mm-hmm. and and do you begin to peel back the avocado, as I like to say, to help them figure out, you know, is entrepreneurship in your wheelhouse or not? Do you have that type of discussion with? Sure, your- I, you know, when somebody comes back and uh, to me and they and they don't know what they want to do everything's on the table. And so for entrepreneurship, I think it really is a question of, of lifestyle preference, of ownership. Um, you know, there are many people who could be entrepreneurs, but maybe need a little more stability and security. And so their values play a large part. Um, there could be, it has a lot to do with risk in many ways. And so, yes, absolutely. When we're talking in conversations, trying to understand what is most important to you. What do you feel like you're best at and you really want to do next? And entrepreneurship, if that's something that comes out as a theme, we explore that for sure. And I refer many people to you. Well, 
and we, which we is appreciate a great it. Resource. as an alum i very much appreciate <laughs> oh and even as not an alum you're a wonderful <laughs> resource for people and and we're going to talk a little bit about the millennials some more uh but before we go there let's let's bring on and danielle thank you very much let's bring sure. on marilyn all right uh so once again, I want to remind our listeners who are listening to Entrepreneur Radio and uh, joining us in the studio or uh, as you've been listening, I don't know if we're calling this Entrepreneur U or <laughs> University <laughs> Radio, but very interesting, uh, compelling stories amongst our guests. And so um, uh, now joining us in the studio, Marilyn, I'm trying to find uh, your information here. You mean Marilyn Santiago? Santiago. Yes. Yes. Um, well, I think... Well, I can help oh, you out here. Here you go. Uh, so Associate Director and of uh, Graduate Career Management at GSU Robinson College of Business and the Sherm Career Connections uh, Co-Chairperson. Yes. All right. Welcome uh, Society to... Society of Human Resources. That's what... Yeah. I was. What's the acronym again? Society, Society of Human, Human Resources. Resources. Personnel Management. Oh, HR there'd management. just be a P in there. HR Management. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so that concludes my line of questioning and testing. Yeah. <laughs> Mark, she's all yours, yeah. <laughs> and and uh, and kudos to Marilyn. It's great because I I, I know all of these folks, and, and especially I had to be reminded about uh, uh, Susan Gilbert. But Marilyn and I know each other from Sherm. Yes, we do. And and your engagement and your volunteerism yes. uh, within the Sherm population. Uh, so talk with us a little bit about um, what trends you're seeing within Georgia State. I see a lot of. Of folks that are coming back to school for the first time. You know, Georgia State is the urban school for Atlanta. And we have a lot of folks that are coming for first generation. Our diversity is high. We have a mixture of uh, students from age, from ethnic backgrounds, from cultural backgrounds, and that have um, caused our environment to be quite uh, positive, quite active, quite progressive, and we're experiencing now where we're being flooded with employers who are interested in our students. And that's an absolutely great thing because we went through a few years of going out to try to get employers to come, particularly alumni. Now we don't have to do as much because they're coming, and our students are getting jobs. Um, They're coming and doing info sessions. They're coming to learn more about our students. They want their branding to be known in in our school. And we want our students to have branding themselves. So we've been working a lot on polishing our students to be ready for the employers that are out there and interested in coming to us. And and uh, kudos to Georgia State because if you if you've ever been in downtown Atlanta, you know, uh, go back ten years and now fast forward to today, it's amazing the transformation that downtown Atlanta is is going through because it's still more. a work in progress, but. GSU is definitely putting a stamp on downtown Atlanta. And when the Braves move to uh, Cobb County next year, it will be very interesting to see how if that will continue to evolve. Because I know the Panthers need probably a new stadium. Almost definitely. <laughs> <laughs> that would help. <laughs> so, yes. and so what, what you know, uh, I know that Dr. Gilbert brought up the study about the millennials and then their their um, motivation or at least desire to potentially be a business owner or to have their own business. Um, what are you finding within Georgia State and, and the, the students that you're serving? You do, are you seeing trends similar to that as well amongst the millennials? Yes. We have uh, um, several specialized programs where they're one year because the millennials like to come in and get out, and they want to have everything now, which is not a bad thing. Um, but we have to have an intense program, which we do, in several different areas, including entrepreneurship and marketing, um, uh, several others, general business, so that they can focus on the areas that they're interested in, get um, hands-on experience with um, internships, and also meet employers, uh, industry leaders who are actually in the business and that can help coach and guide them along the way. We have a program called Executive Career Coaching that we just Um, had last week where we had 120 plus students participate and 35 coaches. They're industry experts. They come from various um, backgrounds and they're usually C-level or they're experienced um, folks who have been in their positions for a long time and have risen up the ranks. 
and they spend 45 minutes to 50 minutes with each student and talk about what they want to talk about, how to get into a particular industry, how to pro- progress in the industry, how to get promoted in their current job, how to start a business of your own, what the bandwidth is to, th- to um, be successful. Um, so the various industries, the various backgrounds to satisfy each student, and it's one of our top signature programs at um, Robinson. And you had how many students participate? 120. And was that the first year that you did that? No, this is probably um, about the seventh or eighth year. We do it once a semester for four days. Wow. Uh, So we took 120 students through four days with 35 different coaches. Mm -hmm. Now, you you spoke a little bit about the diversity. The one thing I noticed about Emory and Goizueta is, uh, Danielle, is it 30%? Correct me if I'm wrong. Thirty percent of the of the uh, Goizueta Business School students are foreign born. Is that correct? Um, probably, yeah. Between thirty and forty percent, I would say. Wow. And then you speak about the demographics, Maryland and Georgia State, right? Same thing. Quite high. Very high. Yes. And and what about you, uh, Susan? What do you find at, at uh, Mercer? So at Mercer University in Atlanta. Many people don't know that it is actually the largest physical campus inside the Atlanta metro area. It's 200 acres right at uh, Spaghetti Junction, very park-like. Um, we have about, I would say, 30 to 40 percent uh, African American. I would say we're 55 percent female. And one of the I would say uh, most positive attributes is that over 50% of our faculty are female, hmm. which is very unusual very in nice. a business school. Yeah, um, But that was very welcoming to me, as you would mm-hmm. imagine. But um, the, um, I did want to say something about uh, educational opportunities um, that might be uh, welcoming both to the millennials who want to be entrepreneurs as well as the people nearing uh, second career time. And um, that is, uh, we are launching in January a professional MBA in innovation. Wow. And I believe it's the first one uh, in the state. Um, it is geared towards people who, A, know they want to be entrepreneurs, or B, want to be innovative within their companies and, and add value within their company so they can rediscover themselves uh, and be intrapreneurial mm-hmm. without leaving their jobs. And so the capstone project is, is either of those two options to either recommend a new product or market within your firm and write a business model for it and, you know... Um, do all the things you would do as an entrepreneur. What's your social media going to be, your social media strategy, how much funding do you need, what kind of organization do you have to build, and so forth. Or the more traditional business model for somebody that knows they want to be an entrepreneur. And it's 16 months in part-time, and we're seeing a lot of interest in it. Um, you know, the, the specialized MBAs, Right. Or the specialized masters, shorter programs are very popular now, but also themed degrees are becoming more popular now. Um, so I, I wanted to uh, to get that out there. I think that um, an MBA is still extremely valuable for entrepreneurs, mm-hmm. but we haven't really focused on working for yourself or working in a startup kind of environment. Mm -hmm. So the first course should be idea generation and customer identification. And the last course should be what's the plan. And in between, instead of what are you doing with your corporate finance, what is your funding strategy uh, and startup needs for the business? So, So that was a reflection that I've had now for a few years that when we started putting together this PMBA course, this PMBA program in innovation, we realized that all 15 courses, which could be titled marketing, strategy, organization, uh, finance, had to be changed. If you were really gearing toward people towards new ventures or new companies. 
And, you know, it's interesting because, uh, so to your point, you're seeing specialization of the MBA programs, whether right. it's technology, in this case it is entrepreneurship. Um, Goizueta and uh, Georgia State, you also, have you started to segment your MBA programs at all? Yeah. Most definitely. Yeah. Before, we probably had just concentrations. Yeah. Now we have specializations and degrees. Mm-hmm. And that's uh, and we're adding degrees based on the, what's happening in the world, not just in Atlanta or in this country, but internationally as well. Yeah, healthcare um, has been a big one at Goizueta. We we recently set up a whole program focused on healthcare certification. It could be in addition to the MBA. It doesn't have to be a full MBA degree, but a healthcare track. Um, nonprofit is something that Goizueta has focused on. It and it really comes from what are the students looking for in their careers? What's the theme that's coming out? And trying to match the needs of of the population and the community. So there's lots of them out there. We and congratulations a- to you. That sounds great with the innovation one. Right. And we spent an awful lot of time with some of the professional organizations in Atlanta. TAG is very um, big with our uh, school. We spent a lot of time with them. Technology is great. Healthcare technology mm-hmm. um, is um, prevalent in this city. We're very fortunate to be in Atlanta with all the companies we have here that are so diverse and that are leaders in this nation and in this world. And we embark on as many projects as we can and bringing them in. And we do a lot of uh, work with data analytics. We have a data analytics lab where we work with companies where they bring their real-life problems to our school. And our students help them work out, figure out the solutions. And they take those back and they actually utilize those solutions in helping their businesses. Uh, So data analytics, healthcare, IT, Mm -hmm. uh, very big. And and how do you and do you, uh, let me start with the do you, uh, do you do provide any type of assessment for, for lack of a better term, the entrepreneurs to really help get their arms around if they're actually predestined or they're wired for or they have certain entrepreneurial attributes that will lend themselves to being successful? Um, do you do any type of assessment that helps measure that? We spend time initially in the exploration um, areas with Career Leader, which Mm -hmm. is an assessment, which I'm sure many of you use. We also use Myers-Briggs. And then we combine all that information to come up with key core competencies. I truly believe if you don't know your core competencies, your strengths, you cannot do your elevator speech. You cannot do your summary. You cannot do your interviewing. You have to know what your core competencies are in order to build to be an entrepreneur, to be a business person in a corporate or nonprofit environment, you have to know your strengths. And you not, and I always tell my folks, don't pay attention to your weaknesses, your areas of development, as much as you need to pay attention to the areas that you're strong in, because that's what's going to make you have a successful career, be it as an entrepreneur or working for someone else. That's, a, that's great advice, yes. actually. And I want to pick up on two things that you said. Mm-hmm. Um, one is the the strength finder, right? And that that's the assessment that we do with our students. Finder. But it doesn't really relegate you to a discipline or even to a function. It's more what you are uh, uh, an identification of of who you are and how you're going to succeed by levering those strengths. Right. Um, the other thing you said, um, and, and we also started a master's in business analytics, very popular, uh, there's a talent shortage. And it's being keenly felt by companies in Georgia. We do an annual survey um, of employees with you know, 13 different chambers of commerce. And um, the number one... Uh, challenge that they face in growing their businesses is access to qual- to, to quality uh, talent. But um, you know, it is it is a great time to be a business student in Georgia. It definitely is. I would also say that it is a great time to pick up technology education. And one of the things that we're doing in the Innovation Center is it's not just business skills that we're teaching. It's also going to be various technology platforms. Um, And we hope to be rolling that out actually to middle and high school students as well. 
uh, because the earlier the better. And to that point, you know, so the talent shortage, is it coming from in the IT space? Is that the biggest talent area of talent shortage that, that you're getting feedback on? That's probably the largest, but not the only. Okay. So employers still say overwhelmingly that their number one uh, major that they're hiring is business. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think uh, business students who have uh, a background in technology are golden right now. They are rock stars in job search. Mm. Mm. And to go back to what your original question in terms of the assessments yes. for entrepreneurship and in, in specifically, um, we also don't do something a, a, a tool that is only for entrepreneurship, but very similar to Marilyn, we use the Career Leader, we use the Myers-Briggs, the Strong Interest Inventory, um, the Berkman is another one right. that we use. And so there's, there's a lot of assessments out there that help people define what are their core strengths, what are their needs in terms of feeling good about their careers, and what are they... What's going to make them happy getting up every morning and going to their job, whether it's a J-O-B or it's uh, something that's much more entrepreneurial. And when you're determining whether you want to be an entrepreneur, I think it's so much more than just your skills. Like I was saying before, it's a lifestyle. It's a commitment. It's a level of ownership. It's a level of risk that you're willing to take. And there's a lot of evaluation that has to go on in terms of those attributes as well as just a personality. And, that, and there's an acronym I use with folks that I work with. It's called ILWI. So it stands for Income, Lifestyle, Wealth, and Equity. Mm-hmm. And those are all four aspects that if somebody needs to define. You know, what does that look like? Um, and because there are different types of business ownership and entrepreneurship will provide you different levels Mm -hmm. of those so part of it is assessing that the other um uh interesting thing is to to zero in on focusing on the strengths um i just left this morning a breakfast meeting with emery emery had the entrepreneurial breakfast uh, breakfast. our monthly yeah that's great yep and and the speaker was a woman that formed uh started a company uh in 1983 and one of the things she shared to the group was i don't manage people because I have already determined that I'm not good at managing people. Uh, and I focus on my strength. I focus on the business development. I focus on the strategy. I fo- and I, and I, have a, I have a partner. And she is a partner. So she, she, that's very strong on the operations side. So, uh, you know, to that point about, f- yes, focus on your strengths, but also offset your weaknesses with resources. In this case, it was a partner. In her, in her firm. Well, that's smart. We tell that them very s- smart. surround yourself with people who do things that you don't want to do or don't know how to do that makes you look wonderful <laughs> and allows everyone to be successful. One of the things I wanted to make sure I mentioned is we do an awful lot of coaching on lifestyle management um, because it's 360. If, if one area isn't right in your life, everything is messed up. And so career coaching involves Um, working with your passion as well. So we spend a lot of time talking about your skills, but we also spend, and your strengths, but we spend a lot of time talking about your passion because I truly believe, and we believe at Robinson, that you have to combine the two in order to be successful. So I always ask the students, tell me what it feels like, smells like, tastes like. You may not have the name. You may not know the title. You may not even know the company. But if you know what it smells like, tastes like, feels like, you're halfway there. What type of lifestyle do you want to have when you go to work? What do you want to do? Do you want to dress up in a suit or do you want to wear jeans? Do you want to work 9 to 5? Do you want to work evenings, weekends? Sit down and think about what it is you want to do, what type of lifestyle you want to have, and then back into it with your passion and come out with your career de- your career development. Mm. You know, I'm reminded of um, Daniel Pink, who said <laughs> that there are three things that make you feel happy at work, that make you that, that lead to loyalty and retention. And one is... Um, Mastery, being good at what you do. Another is impact, feeling like what you do matters. And the third is autonomy, Mm -hmm. to have, you know, the room and space and and trust 
to make decisions and and execute. And, you know, I've been fortunate in my own career to have those three aspects time and again. But at what point do you start feeling like you're the entrepreneur, you know, but we're, but, but receiving a paycheck, which is very nice. Very nice. Yes. Um, <laughs> so if you were to ask me, am I an entrepreneur, I certainly wasn't born one. You know, I, I probably don't have many more, but I worked at the Speedway down the street, you know, when I was 14, uh, bagging groceries. Um, but, um, you know, I, I, in regards to launching an innovation center, I had to come up with a team, with a name, with a social media handle, get some funding, you know, uh, decorate a space, hire a person, all the things that an entrepreneur would have to do. And what I would say to my friends who are over 50 is if, if you, were, you want to embark on that, prepare to work really hard. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, to that point about, um, you know, finding, finding your spot. Um, also, Daniel Pink also wrote the book To Sell as Human. Yep. <laughs> and at the core, you know, it's of true. any entrepreneurial venture, um, it's business development. And yeah. How do you monetize that? Um, the other part that you that you bring up that uh, you, it resonated with me was was when people th- when you have conversations with students, it's like, what's your idea? What's your idea? And they say, well, I'm thinking of my idea. And and it's simple. It seems like you start at the need. And I think Mercer is evidenced by what you're creating. You saw a need in creating something to help people innovate and to become entrepreneurs and to really address that need. Right. Two populations, though. Yep. So millennials yes. who might one day become business owners should get some of that training at school. Mm-hmm. Correct. Including internship experiences, working alongside startups, which right. is what we do at Atlanta Te- Technology Village. Um, but for the community, um, where do they get that training? And even if they've started their business and can't get beyond a certain point, bringing that into classrooms, getting student teams to help tackle how they can grow their business and be more successful. So the second objective um, of the center is the economic development in the region. And, and, you know, it speaks to um, uh, the fact that since we have Emory University – Georgia State and Mercer University here with us today speaks to the core about you know helping somebody mitigate risk and and get around fear of starting something. How would you comment that it starts with education that can help address that? I have an example I'd like to share. Yeah, I had a student who always wanted to have her own nail polish business. She signed up for a specialized um, a program marketing. And she used the class as her guinea pigs for her um, and the learning that she uh, obtained while she was in the class, classes. And she started her um, nail polish business with the students in the class. And they were the ones that did all of her branding with her. And they were the ones that found the company to do the research on the colors that were popular. And they did the marketing plan and the whole bit. And at the end of the of the year, she had her own company with various nail polish colors. Um, she sold them first, of course, to her family and friends, but also to her classmates, who became her sales force. <laughs> <laughs> and now she has a thriving nail polish business. And, and it was her dream, and that's all that she ever wanted to do. Good for her. So yeah. education played a part, and her classmates played a part. And I think that's what school is all about these days. It's not just going into the classroom, listening to a, a professor talk about um, marketing or talk about the subject. It's actually doing it while you're learning. And, and speaks to, you know, you brought up high school. And yep. then we have a great institution, uh, national institution, but a very strong presence in Georgia, Junior Achievement, um, which... Um, uh, Marilyn and I are both involved with SHRM. There's going to be a volunteer event coming up in early December where there's going to be elementary or middle school students going to the Discovery Center that's uh, uh, underwritten by uh, Chick-fil-A and and, uh, other major Georgia employers 
down at the um, uh, World Congress Center area. And have you partake, uh, uh, gotten involved in that and been involved in the Junior Achievement Program? My kids have. Excellent. Yeah, and uh, my husband, every year when Junior Achievement is in the school system, he's the one who teaches the curriculum. They do an outstanding job of making, and going back to what Marilyn was saying, I think there there has to be in today's age with education an applied learning part of it. Um, it can't just be theoretical and just somebody lecturing and teaching. It has to be how are we going to actually implement this, act on this, how do we see it come to life? And that's, um, that's something that, that I think this generation in general is hungry for. Mm -hmm. It's a great point, both of you. Um, I, I unfortunately am not associated with a junior achievement, but I'm pretty active in future business leaders of America, which is I don't know, 100,000 students across the U.S. Right. Uh, they have these enormous conventions, sort of like SHRM, <laughs> um, where you see students voluntarily wearing navy blue and black suits for a couple of days and attending seminars and competing for points and doing mini cases. And it could easily be construed as an early or pre-MBA Really, um, and so I think I think they're getting leadership training in these organizations, which is fabulous. Mm -hmm. Which is fabulous. Um, but you know, I think of entrepreneurship and that sort of training as being um, a set of opportunities that the university has not prepared students for in the past. There was a survey recently that said that. Um, of the 2,500 entrepreneurship programs across universities and the tens of thousands of students who attend them, less than 15% felt that they feel ready to launch a company. So I think that a deliberate, purposeful education and set of co-curricular activities, if that's the best way to do it, like a, a, a degree in innovation or an innovation center or entrepreneurship camps and so forth is long overdue. You know, we do, although we don't have Georgia State represented here, um, the yes, one of the, uh, I mean, Georgia, Georgia Tech. Tech, apologies, <laughs> okay. Georgia Tech, uh, but I was speaking to someone at Georgia Tech that, that founded the entrepreneurial arm of Georgia Tech, and, and students as part of that program, actually come up with businesses. And, and they intentionally um, want students, not they don't want them to fail, but they are expecting them to fail. The failure rate in those startups is dramatically high. And which, you know, they justify that, you know, there's some learning in that. Um, and do you have mechanisms in place uh, that you're aware of that you encourage people to flex their muscle and to do things with the intention that, one of the outcomes will be that they will fail. Well, the research shows that having an affinity group, yes, having people to talk to and work with, um, will result uh, in higher rates of success. Mm -hmm. But yes, Thomas Edison, one of my heroes, said, I've never failed. I just know a thousand ways a light bulb won't work. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, and I think one of of the best educating experiences you can have is failure. You know, mm -hmm. life experience, there's no substitution for just true experience, learning what works, learning what doesn't. And having that in a classroom setting is much safer in many ways and can certainly be a teacher. Um, but I think that the combination of, of, learning all the steps that go into making a business, coming up with the idea, but then learning how to execute on that idea is, is just as important, if not more important, than that idea itself. And so having the practice of being able to say, okay, in a classroom setting, but then in real life, here's, here's how I'm moving forward with it, and it's either working or it's not, and what can I learn from the steps that I'm taking to change my approach? One of the reasons I mentioned executive career coaching as one of our signature programs is because it allows our students to meet with folks who have tried it, 
who've tried it and have failed, who've tried things and have been successful, and allows them to have a relationship with someone that they can bounce things off of. And if we do it, which we do every semester, that allows them by the time they graduate, if they participate in the program every semester, to have several mentors or coaches out there in the industry that can help them. Um, a lot of folks from um, that were in major positions that have now retired also volunteer um, to talk or coach these students, not just those from Atlanta who are only Atlanta known, but who are globally known. Um, so we reach out to all to empower our students. We also encourage them to do internships. We also encourage them to do subcontract work. Um, so you find some.